Nuclear fusion breakthroughs have been coming thick and fast in the past few months. Here's the latest one. China's $1 trillion experimental advanced superconducting tokamak fusion reactor has superheated a loop of plasma to 70 million degrees Celsius, or five times hotter than the sun, for a new record of just over 17 minutes, according to Live Science, breaking the previous record of 390 seconds set by France's Tor Supra tokamak in 2003. Nuclear fusion involves using extremely high pressures and temperatures to induce collisions between hydrogen atoms to make helium, which sees matter converted into light and heat. This process is at the heart of how stars are fueled, and mimicking it is extremely desirable because it does not generate greenhouse gases or nuclear waste. One key difficulty, though, is that fusion reactors cannot recreate the same intense pressure for the reactions as stars, and thus must operate at much higher temperatures. Controlling plasma at these temperatures so it doesn't burn through reactor walls either with lasers or magnetic fields is extremely problematic technically, and as such, New Atlas clarifies that rather than fusion, the latest experiment tested the Chinese tokamak's ability to tolerate such high temperatures over long periods, sustaining superheated plasma similar to the kind that will eventually be used to create fusion, but for now generating much less energy output than goes into it. Live Science explains that the Chinese device is ultimately being used to test out technologies for what is currently the world's largest fusion project, the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor in France, which is expected to come online in 2025. Nevertheless, its progress remains impressive. The new record, announced on December 31st, adds to a previous record set in May, when the same device reached a record plasma temperature of 120 million degrees Celsius for 101 seconds, which was unprecedented. Of course, in the world of fusion development, this is the tip of the iceberg. As different projects around the world move forward, doubts persist about whether fusion will ever really be possible, and major creative solutions will be required if it is ever to genuinely get off the ground. One Zero explains, for instance, that even if the technology does continue to develop as hoped, there are significant upcoming issues with sourcing the two types of hydrogen that fusion relies on, with deuterium found in seawater but tritium extremely rare on Earth. The solution in that case might be that scientists could eventually use the helium-3 isotope as an alternative fuel, mining it either from the moon or asteroids out in space, but it's easy to see why people have their doubts. The only possible reason to consider spending so much time, money, and human effort on something so difficult is that potential benefits of success are just so massive. For perspective, experts suggest just one liter of seawater could produce the energy equivalent of two barrels of gasoline if fusion reactors can be made to work. Alongside this, as mentioned above, fusion reactors generate almost no waste, and any waste they do produce can be recycled into raw material for new reactions. The other 99% of material produced by fusion reactions is hot steam that converts into electricity via the use of turbines, becoming clean water once it cools off. If that's not enough for you, in the event of any malfunction, the ultra-hot plasma generated simply expands and cools off, turning into its harmless gas form, according to 1-0, which adds that even in the case of a leak mid-reaction, the plasma disperses into the atmosphere, which causes no harm thanks to dilution. So obviously, it might never happen, but with such large rewards, the pursuit is not some whimsical science project, it's about completely transforming human society. China has built a new nuclear power plant using technology first developed in the U.S. in the 60s before funding was abruptly halted. Here's what you need to know. Having completed its construction in the Gobi Desert, China will test a thorium-powered nuclear reactor in the next two weeks, according to France 24. While in conventional nuclear plants the fuel is stored inside the fuel rods, in plants with molten salt reactors it is dissolved directly into the molten salt liquid core. Science journal Nature's website explains that these reactors may reduce the risk of explosive meltdowns because they operate at lower pressures. They also operate at higher temperatures, meaning they can produce electricity more efficiently, according to one nuclear engineer at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. The use of thorium as the fuel is considered greener than the use of uranium because it does not create plutonium, which is highly toxic, and because its radioactivity drops off to safe levels in a few hundred rather than tens of thousands of years, according to NPR. For China, another advantage is that this type of reactor does not need to be built near large bodies of water because the salts serve as a coolant, unlike conventional reactors which require massive amounts of water, according to France 24.
What's more, geopolitically, moving away from the use of uranium would reduce reliance on supplies from countries like Canada and Australia, because thorium belongs to a family of rare earth metals that are more abundant in China than elsewhere. When it begins operating, the plant will have the first molten salt reactor in the world since 1969, when the U.S. abandoned its pioneering Oak Ridge National Laboratory facility in Tennessee. Furthermore, it will be one of the only reactors in the world that does not use uranium as fuel and water, instead of molten salt and thorium, according to the head of France's Alternative Energies and Atomic Energy Commission. The reason for that is, basically, that market economics found uranium-235 was the natural candidate for nuclear reactors and did not look much further, according to one nuclear reactor technology specialist at the University of Pisa, who spoke to France 24. Essentially, thorium can't generate fission reactions on its own, while uranium-235 can, so it took more research and funding to develop initially. It also requires extra expensive enriched uranium being added to the core, according to one nuclear engineer, Nick Torin, writing on the What is Nuclear site. So ultimately, no one was willing to write the checks. Whether the fact that thorium is more difficult to weaponize than uranium played a role in this decision is a matter of speculation, but the point is widely made. There are plenty of other issues proposed with thorium. Investment in it might detract from investment in renewable energy, and The Guardian quotes one anti-nuclear campaigner who says thorium does produce dangerous, long-lasting waste products such as iodine-129, which has a half-life of up to 15.7 million years. It also produces uranium-233, the fissile material needed for nuclear power generation, which emits radiation stronger than that of other isotopes, so you have to be more careful, according to the nuclear reactor technology specialist at the University of Pisa, who spoke to France 24. However, regardless of the individual details behind this move, the direction of travel seems clear. China, less interested in being dictated to by market forces, is a place where new technologies are funded right now, more than the US, and examples are wherever you look. In July, Reuters reported that China had unveiled a maglev train capable of a top speed of 600 kilometers per hour or 370 miles per hour. The maximum speed would make it the fastest ground vehicle in the world. Using electromagnetic force, the maglev levitates above the track with no contact between itself and the rail, meaning it hovers in magnetic fields created by huge currents of electricity. And you can see the massive potential behind the project. At 600 km per hour, it would only take two and a half hours to travel from Beijing to Shanghai by train, a journey of more than 1,000 km, or 620 miles. That journey would take three hours by plane or five and a half hours by high-speed rail, and seemingly about a thousand years if you try to get the funding for it in the U.S. right now. Elsewhere, China's position in the new space race tells us similar things about its capacity to push forward new technology compared to the rest of the world right now. China famously became the first country to land a rover on Mars on its first attempt back in May of this year. That mission represented a massive leap for China, because they are doing in a single go what NASA took decades to do, according to Roberto Orosei, a planetary scientist at the Institute of Radio Astronomy of Bologna in Italy who spoke to the Nature Journal. But it's by no means the end of China's ambition. China has launched three astronauts up to its new space station back in June, and the core module of that station contains three separate bedrooms and three times more interior space than its predecessors, Space.com reports, citing China's state-run press agency Xinhua. With the Associated Press reporting that the Chinese station is intended to be used for 15 years, it is likely to outlast the International Space Station, which is nearing the end of its lifespan. And that could mean that very soon, humanity's only working space station is owned by China, an interesting position for the U.S. to be in given it blocked Chinese involvement in the International Space Station. And then there are future plans. Last month, the Times of London reported that China's government plans to launch a fleet of mile-long solar panels into space by 2035 and beam the energy back to Earth. The basic concept involves a space station with a solar array to convert solar energy into electrical energy, then would use a microwave transmitter or laser emitter to transmit the energy to a collector on Earth. The Earth-based station would then transfer the microwave energy back into electrical energy, from where it would be fed into the grid. As part of yet another ambitious project, Beijing has broken ground on the new Bishan Space Solar Energy Station in the city of Chongqing. The station will begin tests by the end of the year, with the hope of having a functioning 1 megawatt solar energy station by 2030. By 2050, China plans to have the station fully operational and producing a gigawatt of power, the same output as the largest nuclear reactor in China. The idea of space-based solar power stations has been around since 1941, with science fiction writer Isaac Asimov first writing about them in the short story Reason. 
But when a number of concept designs were created in the 1970s, none were deemed economically viable until China stepped in. Of course, there are many legitimate reasons to criticize China right now, whether it's for its actions in the South China Sea, or for its aggression towards Taiwan, or for what is happening in Xinjiang. And there is also the example of its new technology pushes going wrong, such as at the world's first next-generation EPR nuclear reactor in Taishan, where six months ago its French part owner sent a memo to the U.S. after radiation around the plant had reached 90% of what was already a revised limit and its Chinese plant operator may have pushed for China's National Nuclear Safety Administration to further increase the plant's shutdown limit. However, it seems clear that if you want to see what anthropologist David Graeber described as poetic technologies, the use of rational and technical means to bring wild fantasies to reality, then right now, you have to look at China. Obviously, if you want to see the 50,000th new iPhone, or Amazon, the world's largest combination of library, post office, and mail order catalog, what Graeber classifies as bureaucratic technology, you can still look at the US. Although Elon Musk, to be fair, is kind of single-handedly keeping America in the game. For more news animations and explainers, hit the subscribe and bell button to join the Tomo News family. Thanks for watching.